Welcome to Circles Off, episode number 56, Derek Johnson, number 56. I don't even know who that is. Don't even, the linebacker used to play for the Chiefs. I don't know why I remember that. I'm horrible with sports player numbers, like horrible. That one sticks with me. There's, there has to be a more, fa- can you think of a more famous 56? You're very good with this stuff, but not off the top of your head, I don't think. 56, I don't think that, you know, it's not a very common number in hockey, which no, is no, what no. I would know. And for football, it's more, you know. Lawrence Taylor, number, number Lawrence 56, Taylor, yeah, so would be the most most popular one. And then a list of of not really a lot of history. Rob Pizzola here, joined by Johnny from Betstamp. How are things? We haven't seen each other in a while. Yeah, it's my first time seeing Rob and uh, since we recorded the last podcast, I think. Did we golf on the next day, last week? We played on Thursday. Okay, no? so that morning and then that was it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, going, going well. I know Rob was in Vegas. We were holding down the fort over here in Toronto. We got, um, you know, a lot of stuff happening with bet stamp on, on the daily. So, you know, we really are trying to run a big business here. And then on the the personal side, getting back into the fitness for the summer, it enough is enough. We got to Like, you know, we got to get going. Health is important as we know, as we all know. Um, but yeah, back into the swing of things, playing hockey now weekly, Football weekly, I'm going to pop a couple of Genos, catch a couple of bombs, and uh, working out on the daily. Healthy eating, you know, not really the biggest problem for me. I'm not like the, I'm not, I don't eat a ton of sweets or whatever, but we're going clean through the summer and into September. Yeah, I mean, healthy eating is not a problem for you, but like Uber is, you know, pretty, Uber adi- eats. you're pretty addicted to No, Uber no, I, I like, listen, I do like Uber Eats, but just because it, the food was delivered to you doesn't mean it was unhealthy. It might not True. be, it might not be the, the healthiest, healthiest yeah. food, but like I'm, I'm not getting McDonald's and stuff. You Have know? you seen the Uber Eats campaigns that they're running now with like, you right. can't just eat everything that gets delivered? Like, what are those? What I guess we're that? talking about it. So it's accomplishing. They got like famous celebrities who are just eating like the packaging that it gets delivered in. Or like I've the t- actually never seen those. Yeah, they're like, oh, Uber Eats. I, I don't even know what the slogan is. Obviously, it's sticking with me. So it's doing something right. But yeah, they're just like, you know, can't just eat everything that's delivered. Yeah, no, I mean, I, listen, I do get Uber Eats a lot. I deleted the app off my phone. You know, it was a mix of basically they, the limiting for the bonus abuse that they that they did to me earlier, as well as the fact that I am trying to just like, you know, cook cook clean now and do it all myself. But um, man, Uber Eats, we don't even talk a random non-sports sports main topic. I told you guys before, I think like Uber Eats is great value. You, you talk about, we talk about finding a lot of value in this podcast and certain things. Uber Eats is unbelievable value even when compared to grocery shopping if you're doing it correctly and again it's just just like sports betting you got to like make sure you're like okay i'm getting the eats pass here and whatever and like this promo might be on doordash and this might be on skip the dishes and whatever like you definitely got to shop around from dealer to dealer get the best price but like uber eats you can get like sometimes like two things delivered to your door if they have a buy one get one it's like including tax and tip might be like eleven dollars. Like you're not getting that at the grocery store. No, I agree. I mean, for me, the big thing is, uh, I think both of us are are guys that put a heavy emphasis or value on our time, and it's the time of grocery shopping and cooking, you know, driving to the grocery store. It, no, but here's what I'm saying: if you include your time in there, then obviously Uber Eats is going to be good value because like just the time to actually go to the grocery store and actually cook you know, assign a dollar per hour value on your head that you're going to be above that. However, I'm saying excluding the time, excluding even convenience and time, there is still ways in which you can get like food that's like relatively good food for cheap. Like, you know, like a buy, buy one, get one on like a chicken salad, for example, grab one for lunch, grab one for dinner, like save it for dinner, like both to your door for like 16 bucks. That's not horrible. I mean, yes. Can you make that salad cheaper? over the course of making like 20 of those by going to the grocery store, getting like a, a chicken from Costco and then getting, you know, salad from Costco and get, doing all this. Yeah, for sure. You make it slightly cheaper, but it's not, it's not that much cheaper. And you do have to, you know, make like 20 salads before you ellipse that value and use all that food. I get it. You have more self-control than I do though. Uh, like I'm, I'm pretty skinny guy. I weigh 170 pounds, um, but I'm diabetic. So I don't have the self-control like, even though I know I'm not supposed to eat crappy food, high carbs, whatever, if I go through Uber Eats and I see like Freshy or like some salad place and then I, you know, you get to the burgers row, you know, A&W, Hero Burger, whatever, right? It's very difficult for me not to, to get the burger. Whereas if we do grocery shopping during the week, 
it's a little bit easier to stay regimented. You know what I'm saying? I just I, don't have the self-control. I, I think more people are like me. It's very difficult to get like good food on Uber Eats. Mostly people start eating like crap. I agree. I recently also discovered that you could do alcohol delivery here as well <laughs> in Ontario for, for that. And it's just like, that's a no brainer, you know, like a couple extra bucks and just get your beers delivered. That is a no brainer. That's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. I mean, you don't get the same variety. So if, let's say you're like, okay, I only drink this beer. They don't have it. All right. You're tough luck. But if you're like the guy who kind of like doesn't really care that much what beer or like you have like 10 you like, man, deliver to the house. I don't have to go in. I hate going to the beer store. People I, in the U.S., we only have basically, well, we, you can get beer at grocery stores now. But yeah, it's bad selection. If you go to a grocery store, you can only get like a, the max you can get is like a six pack. So it's like horrible value. Yeah. If you go to the beer store, you can actually get a two four. And like the beer store sucks. Yep. I don't know if you like it. It's like, well, uh, I mean, whatever. I'll do it. I'm, Why don't you like it? What, what is the You issue? walk into the beer store, you're waiting in like a line of people returning empties so they can get back like 60 cents. <laughs> on their thing and they they have to sort it like they're they're coming in you come with a box of empties and like okay yeah here's your here's your empties but sort these all like, yeah oh there's like different buckets and stuff. yeah that's my wife so i can't she, <laughs> i don't know if she's gonna listen to this one i know Fair she knows enough. i'm I like you want, me to, week, you want so. me to sit here and sort all these dirty beer bottles and to get back like 65 cents like okay no problem i'll throw them out like what do you what do you want me to do I get it. Um, I have two items on the agenda that I just really want to quickly talk about. Uh, we are going to have Adam Burke on. Um, NHL, NBA coming to an end. It's going to be a lot of baseball over the course of the offseason. I know a lot of people have reached out about baseball betting. They're new to it, just following it. Uh, Adam, to me, is one of the best baseball betting analysts. Works for VEASAN. Uh, for years, I have read his MLB season previews, which I would put... Uh, toe-to-toe with any season preview in any sport they're amazing uh so we will have him on but there's a couple things i have to get to uh, why don't you why don't you hit the sound bite that you cut for uh i'll tell you how big of a scumbag i am i'm gonna follow that up with i ripped a guy last week on tweets that trigger us <laughs> bet player props okay very big scumbag move for me because i saw that tweet and i was very it triggered me that's why i was in the segment I was visibly like actually shaking when I was reading the tweet about um, it was a specific to not understanding the host rules for player props. I did not know that FanDuel is only offering a one-way market for those. So in fairness, there's nothing the guy could have done. So this is my apology. I, I am a scumbag, but I want to write the, write the ship whenever I do rip someone for, you know, unfairly bet player props. That's my apology. I'll tell you how big of a scumbag I am. Yeah, that's a bad move on our end because, uh, you know, we're telling him read the rules and then we didn't even know that was a one-way market. So, yes, 100%. If it's a one-way market and they're not taking action unless the player starts and you can only bet the yes and the player doesn't start, they are free-rolling you. Heavy. Yes. If you avoid that 100%. So, when he said he contacted FanDuel Rule Support, yeah, that's a fine thing to do. Definitely. Um, This, this This isn't on you at all, though. Because I brought that to the table... Some like a lot of times the people don't know this, but the tweets that trigger us. Uh, Rob, such a nice guy. It's okay. I I talked about it too. I I don't mind. uh, Sometimes one of us is seeing it for the first time live on air because we don't want to spoil the reaction sometimes, right? And go into it. It's better like that. Agreed. So this is not on Johnny. He didn't really know. This one is on me. I will own it. The second thing though, which really triggers me as well. I told you to remind me about this when we recorded last week. I'm like, I want to talk about seat shaming. Don't, don't let oh, me forget. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go. He's like, yeah, no. Okay, seat shaming. This is one of the things that bothers me the most about anything. Like, I, I'll post a ticket to a Leaf game, for example, or Blue, Blue Jays game, whatever, where I'm sitting in the upper level. And people are like, oh, you know, did you bring your binoculars? Oh, like, you know, it must have had a horrible betting week or whatever. I've been attending sports events for my entire life. The quality of the seat is not directly correlated to the price of the seat. I want to make that explicitly clear. Got to find the value where you can. Four years ago, five years ago now maybe, Bruins, Leafs, round one of the playoffs. I sat first row behind the away team penalty box, behind the Boston Bruins penalty box. I paid $2,000 for that ticket to sit first row. I would rather sit in the upper deck 
at like center ice than sit in those seats ever again. You literally cannot see any of the play. People are, it is a disaster. You can't see anything unless the action is directly in front of you. I've even sat first row glass directly behind one of the nets. They're great seats when something's happening on your side of the ice. When it's on the other side of the ice, you're just watching the scoreboard the entire time anyways. Yeah, furthermore, one thing you didn't even mention is if you sit platinums and you're like, let's say five, six rows up, seven rows up, when you, like, it, you let's say you're center ice, you can't see the other end as Rob mentioned, okay? So you, you did mention that. In order to see it, you do have to stand up. So if the play's there and it's like a power play, you got to stand up and, moving the mic now, you gotta stand up and look like that. Oh, what's going on? When you're standing up, then there's guys behind you Hey, sit down. Sit down. And yeah, always whatever. Hey, Matthew, sit down, whatever. Like, yeah, okay. It's, it's yeah. literally like, come on. I, like, I can't see. Then I got to sit down also. And then you also kind of feel bad as a guy. Like, oh, I don't even want to stand up here because the guy behind me might exactly. not see anything. Whatever. It's a shitty experience. But on top of that, like the, the first, listen, this is not me patting myself on the back or anything like that. But game one of this year's playoffs for, for the NHL was the least lightning game one. I bought the tickets for myself and for three friends. I brought them to the game with me, okay? Spent money to, to pay for their tickets. You know, we sat in worse seats because I, I, like, I'm not going to pay for 1500 bucks a ticket for everyone to sit in the 10th, 15th row, but they were very appreciative of it. They enjoyed that as a game, and I have no problem sitting in those seats. You see the whole play and whatever, but like, there's a component of that as well. Blue Jays games, baseball. I wouldn't be caught dead in one in like lower level outfield. To me, I would rather just watch the game on TV. I'm not there to catch a foul ball. People sit there so they and they bring their gloves so they can catch a foul ball. You can't see balls and strikes. You only can really have good visibility of like one outfielder there. Might as well not be there, in my opinion. I spend more time at the bar than I would actually do in those those seats. But put me upper deck, you know, behind home plate. I love that. You can pretend like you're calling balls and strikes. Obviously, you can't you can't see the the height of the pitch, but you can see if it's over the plate or not. Still get on the ump's case or whatever. Plus, the atmosphere there is so much better because all the booze bags are in that section. It's always complete debauchery, which I like when I'm at a game. I don't. I'm not going to a library. I'm going to a sporting experience where I want to be an experience. So, I yeah. just hate seat shaming. Like people have their own preferences for seats. You know, maybe if somebody had like an obstructed view or something, I would call them out. But at the end of the day, maybe they just want to be at the game because of the atmosphere more than the view or whatever. Like, don't seat shame. It's just, it's just so shitty. I felt so bad at uh, game seven because the Leafs lost, but also felt bad because I was standing up for the majority of the third period. Just, you know, obviously a lot of the crowd was standing up and uh, directly behind me was like a seat behind me uh, was like an older gentleman and his wife. They did not stand up the entire game. Like, not even when goals were scored, nothing. They were just sitting there. And, um, like, he did not say one thing, did not complain. Third period, I was standing probably like five minutes straight. He couldn't see anything. I was trying to look back and just be like, oh, can you see? Whatever. He couldn't see. He didn't care. I guess he didn't care. And then there's like three minutes left in the game. The whole stadium is standing. He's still sitting behind me. He taps me from behind. I was like, ah, it's going to make me sit down. He's like, excuse me, sir. I seem to have dropped my phone under your seat. <laughs> <laughs> you mind grabbing it for me? Went under, grabbed it for him, gave it back. He did not care at all. And when where we were sitting, like, it was looking up to get to the Jumbotron. Like, I don't even know if you could see the Jumbotron. You just, I guess, just happened to be You're there. just hearing the sounds of the yeah, game. Yeah, just hearing the sounds of the game. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, you can't even feel bad. My ideal seats is, like, the uh, first row of the upper bowl. Love that. Any stadium, first row of the upper bowl. No, you know, you don't have people in front of you. You're there in quick. You can lean up against something. You just got the cup holders and you could see the whole stadium money. And for the Jays games, for any baseball games, I love the upper level right behind the plate, like as close to the plate as you can. Then you, you can see if the balls and strikes are like left or right. Exactly. Obviously you can't see movement top to bottom, but those are, uh, those are awesome. Yeah. I, I listen at the end of the day, there's obviously a number of different reasons why someone would buy different tickets and like, just don't be like the, the shithead that is calling people out for where they're sitting at a game. Exactly. Especially a playoff game. Here's another thing too. Like, I'm not going to name names, but like the people who are calling me out, I'm looking up playoff tickets in their city and they're literally one-tenth of the price of playoff tickets in Toronto as well. So, yeah. I'm you know, I would sit courtside at every game if I could in, in your city. Anyways, that's it. 
we will move on. Um, we want to do want to talk some baseball. So we're going to welcome in Adam Burke. You can follow him on Twitter at Skating Tripods. He's a sports betting analyst for Vison. He's a Cleveland native. We'll talk to him a little bit about that. Travels a lot. An IPA aficionado and a 500 time dumb and dumber viewer, according to his Twitter profile, which is my favorite comedy of all time. We'll talk about that as well. Adam Burke now joins Circles Off. Adam, welcome to Circles Off. How are things? I'm good. It's good. I'm, I know we've tried a few times to get this thing recorded and get it in the can, so I'm happy that we're finally doing it, and it's an honor to be on here with you guys. People actually don't know the missions we have gone through. We, we had started an interview with Adam. Our internet crapped out on us. That actually led to us doing some studio renovations, as we called them, but uh, glad to have you on, Adam. And what we like to do with every guest at the beginning is uh, just give us some of your personal background and, and basically how you got involved in the betting space. Yeah, so I mean, my story is probably fairly traditional in terms of how I got started. My college roommate, my sophomore year, had a bow dog account, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, kind of turned me on to that. And I was betting the, you know, five dollar three line parlays, like I'm sure so many people started out doing, and uh, obviously, given the legal space, so many people continue to do. Uh, but it just kind of progressed from there. You know, my majors in college were mass media communication. So I've always been a writer. Always wanted to do the on air thing. So just kind of gravitated towards being a content creator in the sports betting space and got hooked up with Jeff Rake, who, uh, you know, you introduced me to when you were out in Vegas here recently and got to do some work for beyond the bets. And then when Matt Lindemann got a job uh, behind the counter out here in Vegas, I wound up getting found by my boss at bangthebook.com. So I was there for eight years with him and, uh, now I'm with VEASAN. So, you know, it's just kind of been a, an interesting progression in terms of the content creation space for sure. What does your day-to-day look like in terms of betting or from a betting perspective? Because obviously, like you uh, mentioned, you have commitments in the in the betting space uh, from a content side of things with VEASAN. Are you betting year-round? Uh, are you focused primarily on baseball? Because that, I, I, you know, I follow your stuff for years. I know you're a big baseball guy. And then what does that look for? What does that look like for you on a day-to-day perspective? Yeah. So look, I mean, I will openly admit that I'm a content creator first, a handicapper second, and a better third. So a lot of what I'm playing, the vast majority of, of what I bet is something I've written about, you know, whether it's the daily MLB article, whether it's contributing to a, you know, a staff or, or a writer best bets file across NFL, college football, college basketball, whatever the case may be, you know, I, I go through my handicapping process, write it out, and then I wind up playing the things that I find. So I do end up betting year round due in large part to the fact that I kind of need to familiarize myself with, with pretty much every sports betting market uh, used to be even more, you know, when I was with bang the book, it was a smaller operation and I was responsible for also writing golf and UFC and NASCAR coverage. And uh, based on the ROI I had with those, I'm very thankful. I don't have to do that anymore, <laughs> but you know, I just, I have to do a, you know, I have to be aware of things year round. I have to know a lot of different stuff for doing guest spots for filling in when hosts are out, stuff like that. So you know, everything just kind of feeds into itself into to one big, great, you know, handicapping, betting and, and writing and recording process. I do appreciate your honesty with that answer. Uh, and I actually do really like the fact that you're willing to bet on um, the content that you're putting out there, which I think is one of the big problems in the space. So we truly appreciate that. There's nothing that bothers me more than someone who would recommend someone else wager on something, but isn't willing to bet them bet that themselves. So that's, that's pretty cool. And I'm glad you brought that up. But just on a personal level, Adam, um, we've obviously been acquaintances for a long time and uh, largely through social media, but you're a Cleveland native. I know you've spent most of your life uh, not living in Vegas and now you're there. Uh, I ran into you about a month ago when I was there. How has that transition been for you on a personal level, um, you know, going to that that day to day lifestyle in Vegas? Yeah, you know, it's it's a challenge. I mean, you know, being a a Midwestern kid growing up in Cleveland, you know, people are, are just different than they are out here in Vegas. You know, everybody out here has a hustle. Everybody out here, you know, I I would say to some degree, there's, there's a higher level of selfishness out here. That is something that I've, you know, kind of had to grow accustomed to. And, you know, it's also funny too, because I I was thinking about this yesterday when we were, you know, actually going to finally get this thing recorded. And, you know, last week I had some buddies in town and, you know, we went downtown and, you know, I I traditionally think of going downtown to, you know, drink some beers and throw some dice and, and just kind of hang out from coming out here two, three, four times a year before I lived here. Now, sometimes I have to go downtown to work and I understand why there's, you know, a certain level of animosity from, you know, locals towards the tourists because the tourists are out here to have fun and everybody else is out here, you know, grinding away with that. And I don't even want to say nine to five because it's definitely not a nine to five town, but 
you know, it's uh, it's definitely been a significant adjustment. But I will tell you, uh, the weather is a hell of a lot better, especially in the winter time. Yeah, that I'm it's very the dry jealous. heat too. It's the nice dry heat. Well, I mean, listen, I'm coming from the weather. I don't know how good our cameras are, but like I fell asleep in the sun on the first day, top of the head, absolutely roasted. Oh, poor guy, I fell asleep, fell but, asleep in the sun. Yes, but came back here, and uh, it's it's a little chilly re- relative to what I was used to in Vegas for the last week. But I'm uh, just out of curiosity, Adam. Do you st- do you still get to ever really enjoy it like a tourist, or is is it just completely changed for you? Because you know, on a personal level, I've thought about moving to Vegas many times in my life before, and for me, it's like I I don't really think things would change. Like I'd still be able to play blackjack, do whatever I want to do. Um, but from the sounds of things, it seems like for you, it's just harder to have that tourist mentality at any point. No, it's funny. I mean, I, I try to do it as often as I can. You know, fortunately, just kind of with the nature of, of the work and, and what's kind of asked of me, I, I do have a certain level of flexibility, you know, throughout the day and, and in the evening hours. So, you know, I try to make it a point to, you know, go down to the strip and just sort of walk around, people watch a little bit. I, I don't want to lose that side of Vegas because I think it would make it extremely hard to live here. You know, I've made some friends, obviously, with colleagues at Visa and all of that. But, you know, I mean, I was... 34 years born and raised in Cleveland, you know, friends that I've had since high school, friends I've had since grade school. My buddy was out here last week. We grew up together. We met when we were six years old. You you don't have that when you go to a new place. So, you know, I I try to sort of keep that, that fun and and maybe the romantic side of Vegas, you know, just going out and, and doing the things that I would have done as a tourist. But at the same time, you know, this is a phenomenal food town, you know, so we're always finding different places to eat out in the suburbs and, and all that. So, you know, I I'm, I'm, don't know how long I'll be here, but I'm trying to live it up as much as I can while I'm here just to uh, explore all the different parts of the city and the the different cultures and the different cuisines. That's cool. And I, I think that's a good mentality to have. Um, we will get into more of, of the personal side of things uh, a little bit later on. Uh, your Twitter uh, profile or your Twitter description, I find to be very interesting uh, in terms of some of the stuff that I can ask you about. But um, this is a sports betting podcast. And we did want to do a bit of a baseball betting primer. Um, I follow baseball, but I don't bet it like I used to before. We're not, you know, we're not huge baseball fans here, but we continuously get questions about baseball. And with the NBA and NHL winding down now, obviously just as good a time as ever uh, to get into the baseball season and what things people, things that people can look for. So before we do get into that, just want to touch on your handicapping process a bit so people understand where the information is coming from. Is it fair for me to say that you're more of a subjective based handicapper than a, a traditional numbers guy? So, you know, look, I, I try to blend the numbers and sort of, you know, just observations, things I've kind of picked up on from, from being an observer of baseball for a long period of time. Primarily speaking, I do look at the data. I do look at the metrics and try to interpret them, you know, look for predictive indicators of positive and negative regression, stuff like that. The thing that's really challenging about baseball, and I know that we'll get to this a little bit later on in the show, is that it's the only sport where the object you play with fundamentally changes year in and year out. And so the stats that I use to handicap almost vary a little bit from season to season, or at least the weight that I place on them varies from season to season, just because, you know, in 2019, we had, I think it was five teams that topped the previous all-time record for home runs hit in a season. This year, the ball's not carrying at all. So the stats that I have to rely on or the stats that I weigh a little bit heavier do change year in and year out. So, you know, I use a lot of the metrics. There's a ton of data out there. And I know we're going to get into that as well, but you know, I just kind of go game by game through the card and, and try to find as many actionable edges as I can based on the, the metrics that are out there. Okay, that's a good starting point there because you talk about how there's a ton of data out there. That's a, one of the most obvious questions or one of the most obvious starting points for someone who's looking to bet baseball. Um, I think the beauty of any, you know, beauty of betting baseball is that it, you, you, there, there's just so much that you can possibly access out there that you can use as part of your handicapping process. So for someone who's looking to get started in the space, what are some resources that they would, would be able to seek out in order to access data to bet on the sport? 
Yeah, I would say it's sickening the number of tabs I have up from Fangraphs.com on a daily basis. Uh, Fangraphs is just a, an outstanding resource. The presentation of data is really nice too. And, and if you are somebody smart enough to model, and, and that's not me, but it's very easy to export their data, kind of get it into the spreadsheet, sort of prioritize what it is that you're looking for. So Fangraphs is an outstanding resource. Baseballsavant.com is one that I started using maybe four or five years ago, uh, which is the home of StatCast data. So you've got exit velocity metrics, hard hit rate, all the expected stats that go into it based on the batted ball data and all of that. Uh, you know, I've used that search function a ton, trying to find different ways to incorporate that data into my handicapping. So Fangraphs and Baseball Savant are really the two biggest for me. But then there are things just as simple as, you know, following and monitoring bullpen usage, you know, yeah. or making sure that you have a good weather resource, something like that. You know, those are things that can make the difference between, you know, betting a full game or betting a first five, betting it over or staying off of a game, something like that. So, you know, I just, I try to use as much data, as much information as I can on a daily basis. And then my goal as a handicapper is to take everything that I've interpreted and analyzed and rewrite it into something that's digestible for a you know larger audience that maybe isn't as familiar with some of those metrics. I've used fan graphs and baseball savant as well. I think those are amazing resources. One thing I was just going to ask is like when you're looking at those specific sites, um, it's kind of more of a, I don't want to ask you what to look for because I'm sure you get that a lot. Here's what I'd say. What are the biggest traps that people fall into on there? So there's tons of different stuff. Most of the time, those sites have like their own models or predictions that you can kind of pull in with. But what what are some things to avoid? Like what what not what do I not do when I'm there? Well, so something that I've I've really thought a lot about over the last few years. You know, if you look at line moves that take place out there in the marketplace, a lot of times if you've got a pitcher with a low ERA and a high FIP or a high X FIP, that's going to be a guy that money is going to come in against. And if you've got a guy with a high ERA and a low FIP or a low X FIP money is going to come in on that guy because of the expectation of regression one way or the other. But I think it's just too simplified to just look at that and blindly say, Hey, this guy's going to get better, you know? And, and it did actually happen the other night with Jose Barrios of, of the blue Jays, but he'd be giving up a ton of hard contact. There was a reason why his ERA was as high as it was. There's a reason why his metrics looked as bad as they did. So I think to me, what I would say is, if you start to get a basic understanding of the advanced concepts and some of their predictive value, you still have to apply the right levels of context to know that you know, look, a guy may look like he's in line for positive or negative regression, but if he's giving up a lot of hard contact or if he's not locating well or something like that, then there's no guarantee that that's going to take place. So for me, it's kind of about, I've done the handicapping 101 and 201 thing with baseball. Now it's just kind of adding some of the, additional you know points of emphasis that will show you if something is likely to happen or if it's likely not to happen i absolutely love that answer because i think it's uh, applicable to all sports and i think a lot of people look at luck factors or luck metrics or signs of of um potential regression whether that's positive or negative and, and the baseball example that you use with era compared to fip or x fip or sierra or whatever is is a perfect one um, where, you know, I see this in other sports all the time. We can use, uh, just just because it's in season now, hockey is an example, though, where um, they'll say, oh, you know, this player is shooting at X percent. Eventually, he's going to regress towards league average. Or this goaltender is making saves at X percent. Eventually, he's going to regress towards league average. Um, but there's an underlying history of this player being able to continuously perform at that level and not fall victim to the, to the quote-unquote luck metrics. And we see it in in football and basketball and so on and so forth. So I do really like that because I think a lot of people just fa fall into that mindset of, well, this is their actual performance. This is what their expected performance should be, but there's no context applied to that expected performance. And, and I do think that there are some athletes, uh, especially in baseball, that are able to just get through a career with, you know, very low BABIP um, or, you know, their ERA being higher or lower than their their expected ERA or so on and so forth. So I really do like that answer. Um, yeah, hold up, though, hold up. So yes. here, here's my question: Like, I don't I don't do baseball modeling at all. Okay, and I barely know what those metrics are. Yep. But just from being around community and stuff like that, I know exactly what those metrics are. I know what BABIP is. I know batting average on balls in play. I know why it's important. I know what FIP's it. Uh, what FIP is? X FIP difference between them. Um, you know, taking into account defense and stuff like that versus not taking into account defense. So 
I know all this stuff and I barely know about baseball. So what, what that would kind of, in my mind, lead me to believe is like, is it actually that valuable? Because do the people who are actually betting on baseball, modeling, shaping the markets, they obviously have that plus potentially way more. So my question, I guess, for both of you guys would be, you know, can somebody who is just learning out actually put together something that has any value using the metrics that are currently available online? I'll let Adam start with that. Is that a fair question, Adam? Yeah, I mean, look, I think some metrics have kind of lost some of their luster, I guess I would say. You take a statistic like XFIP, for example, which is expected fielding independent pitching that assumes a league average home run to fly ball percentage. Well, most guys aren't going to have a league average home run to fly ball percentage. You know, if you're an extreme ground ball pitcher, you just don't have the sample size of fly balls. So whatever home runs you give up, you're probably going to end up carrying a very high percentage of home runs to fly balls. On the flip side, if you're an extreme fly ball pitcher, you're going to have a large sample size of fly balls. So if you give up home runs, it's not going to look as bad for you. So like to me, that's a stat that has lost some of its value here. I think it's just sort of one of those things where we're always adapting. We're always evolving. There's always going to be new metrics and new stats that are out there. Really up until this year, I didn't take expected ERA into account too much, a creation from the guys over at Pitcher List, just because I thought, you know what, we have enough things that encompass, you know, there are at least enough indicators that encompass, you know, whether or not a guy is getting lucky, is getting unlucky, something like that. But now in a season where we have the highest exit velocity ever in the StatCast era, but we have the lowest batting average of all time, and we have the lowest fly ball carry in the StatCast era, like different metrics mean different things based on the season. And sort of to use an example that I'm sure Rob would, would agree with here, you know, you got a goalie who's making, you know, maybe more saves above average than he should. Right. Well, what's the opponent's shot quality? You know, does he just play on a team where, you know, they keep guys out of the middle of the ice. They force a lot of long range, low percentage shots. It's the same thing with Babbitt. You know, if you've got a high Babbitt and you're giving up a lot of hard contact, that may not get better for you. But if you have a high Babbitt and you're inducing a lot of weak contact, maybe that's the defense. That's the problem for you. So, yeah, I think a lot of the metrics out there can allow people to either create a model or at least create some sort of betting and handicapping process. But I think you just have to go a few steps beyond where you used to have to go because of the data that's available and because of the line equity that gets taken away by people that already know this stuff that are betting the overnights. Yeah. So and just to add to that, I agree with everything you said, by the way, um, I think with every sport now, you just kind of like have a starting point of, okay, these metrics are not going to give you an edge. Like you're not going to get an edge by just handicapping using fielding fielding independent pitching or Sierra or BABIP or whatever. But if you completely ignore them, you're not going to have any context whatsoever. You don't really have a starting point. And that starting point will change in every sport as time goes on for sure. But then you just have to apply additional context with additional metrics. And I think it's very important to ask yourself when you're breaking down a game is just like continuously ask yourself why something is happening until you can no longer explain it. And that's kind of like where you've reached the point of, okay, this, this makes sense to me. And I think your, your goalie example was a really good one there, Adam. So yeah, um, in every sport, your traditional metrics evolve. And I think we're seeing that in baseball, especially, um, but you, you just can't ignore them either. They, you kind of have to use them as a starting point. So Adam, um, another thing that came up recently is you mentioned actually like the exit velocity stuff, like that's all the stat cast data. Is that correct? Yes. So with the stat cast data basically coming into the market and being a hundred percent publicly available, do you think that's had a, a, an impact like either positive or negative for, for people who are betting this? Like, what do you think the impact is of that? Like just a ton of data, high quality tracked by the MLB that people would never be able to get and just publicly released? So I think it's kind of a two-prong answer here. I, I think it can be a negative for some people because, and, and I've experienced this, I'm experiencing this right now, and, and maybe we'll get into this a little bit more, but just because you know the, the baseball is dramatically different this season, I find myself getting paralysis by overanalysis. I feel like I'm digging into too many different things now because there's so much stuff available out there. And, and I'm not just taking the numbers at surface value. I'm applying context, trying to figure out you know, how to not only convey this idea to the readers, but also turn it into a bet that I'm actually going to make. So I think it can be a negative in terms of there being too much out there, especially if you're trying to understand and evaluate it all at once when you're just starting out. On the flip side, I think it's obviously a positive for people that, you know, know 
what they're doing, know how to interpret the data, uh, know the you know the value of what these different numbers and metrics mean. Because you know it, it's it's such an old cliche, but you know knowledge is power. I mean, the more that you know, the the more you know apt you are to to make smart bets, to know what's going on league wide, pitcher wide, hitter wide. This may be. So I think it's a little bit of both. You know, I think it's kind of a uh, a necessary evil in some ways, I guess, to to try and have all of this stuff as part of your toolbox. But then I also know people that have success betting with traditional metrics, betting totals based on home plate umpires and, and strike zone sizes and, you know, all those different types of things, too. So I think it's just on a case by case basis. But I, I do believe it can be both a positive and negative. And even for somebody like me, who's been looking at Sabre metrics for, for the better part of 15 years, I think there are times where it's still a positive and a negative for me on a day to day basis. Well, the Just, more the more data that comes in, sorry Rob to cut you up. The more data that comes in, the more it actually, in my opinion, favors the people who are like have experience shaping and modeling data versus like rookies. I right? agree. I would agree with that. But also, if the data set was only available to a few people, then it doesn't matter how good you are at modeling, right? If you have if you only have like data from NHL.com and someone else is getting all the team level data. I think what we like just from my personal experience. The, I stopped betting baseball seriously would have been 2018 or 2019. I'm horrible with memory in terms of, of dates, but that were, was... Were you doing the daily grind? Yes. Just for the people. You were actually... I, betting, I was, I was like, betting... Ba- like Modeling I, and betting daily, like 10, 20 plays a day. Up at 7 a.m., not going... Leaving my computer until the final lineup was in of a, of a game. So literally the daily grind. And that was seven days a week. But I stopped when the stat cast data started to become available. Um, and you know, it, it just became like so overwhelming of like, I have this well-oiled machine now of a model that's using, you know, my own projection system essentially that I developed, but now we have all this new data entering market. People are starting to use it. I'm going to have to evolve. I no longer am going to have an edge because this is more sophisticated than what I'm actually using in terms of data. Now I just got to the point where it's like, I, I'm not willing to do this anymore, but I think I, I, I've i noticed this in every sport um, where I do agree with, you know, Adam, you say you're going through the, the, the paralysis by over analysis. I definitely think that that's a thing where just you get so much data that becomes available. You, you, you tell yourself that you have to incorporate it in some capacity. I have to use this. This is great stuff. I could tell, you know, how hard the ball's coming off the bat. I can see launch angles from players and so how the percentage of times that they barrel a ball and so on and so forth. But you get to a point where it becomes too much at, at some point. And uh, I think sometimes simplifying the process leads to just better success in, in, in the sense that, you know, you're not second guessing things necessarily. Because I think that's the, the biggest challenge overall is when you have access to all this data and, and you're on a, in a, a losing streak or something, you start to second guess everything. Oh, what I'm using this too much. I'm not using this enough and so on and so forth. So I think there's something to that. Uh, but there's going to be like a new version of, of stat cast data eventually as well too, right? Like we're, there's always iterations and data for every sport and especially a sport like baseball, you'll get something in four or five years from now where everyone will start to incorporate. And then it's like, uh, you know, should we be doing this? Is, is this actually an advantage using this data set and so on and so forth? So I think that's one of the most fascinating things with baseball though, um, compared to every other sport is just, there's so much, at your disposal at, at any given time and trying to figure out what is worthwhile and what is just fluff is probably more challenging than any other sport. I think to that point, you know, like you talked about it, if you start struggling, you know, if you have your process and it's working for you and it's working for a longer period of time, and then all of a sudden you hit a rough patch, whether it's variance, whether it's just bad handicapping, whatever the case may be, like you said, then you start incorporating different things because you're like, have I lost something? Is there something I'm not accounting for? What do I need to add? What do I need to look at more? And that just becomes, you know, kind of, it can be a downward spiral, you know, unless you find something that is, is really beneficial for you that maybe you weren't looking at, or you start applying something to a higher degree. I'm, I'm kind of in that spot right now where, you know, I had a really good month of April, a good start to May. And this is supposed to be the time of the year when I do better because I've got sample sizes to analyze. I can look at some of those indicators of positive or negative regression, but this year is unlike any other that I've ever experienced and encountered because there's just no offense. So I'm looking at pitchers that I think are going to experience negative regression, and I'm sitting there questioning myself if any of them are going to because 
no one's hitting, no one's scoring runs, no one's doing anything. Your Blue Jays are a prime example, right? <laughs> they make violent contact every game. They have the second highest hard hit rate in Major League Baseball. They are awful with men in scoring position. They are ter- they were the worst team in the league in batting average on balls in play, weighted on base average, WRC plus, all the above. But they're too good of a lineup for that to continue. And I just I, I keep losing money on them, thinking that you know their overs are going to start coming through, or they're going to start you know winning games as a big favorite, something like that. It's just it's it's fr- that endless chase having all that data can be something that kind of takes you off the path from time to time. Let's talk a little bit about the dynamic this season because I think it's a really interesting one. Um, the most serious baseball better that I know who has had the most success of anyone that I know um, would tell you that I believe he said it was 2019 when all the home runs started happening. The first two months of the season for him was the worst that he'll have his entire lifetime because predominantly was an unders better and the games were flying over the total because of the juiced ball and his models just could not react quickly enough to it. And even as they were starting to catch up to market, still wasn't catching up enough because they're very much built off of a, a historical data set um, all these previous years. Now we get the complete opposite this year. So I'm watching baseball the first two weeks of the season and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, scoring's down, home runs are down. Is is that going to continue going forwards? And the market, in my opinion, was not reacting heavily to that early on in the year. So I think anyone who was just blindly betting unders at some point probably could go retire, you know, find some private island somewhere at this point uh, because it took so long to react. But now we're at the point, Adam, where we're in here a few months now. We have a, a larger data sample. Um, how do you how do you treat this this style of game now? Because it's completely different to anything that you would have handicapped in years past. Yeah, it's been really frustrating for me, especially because, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I've incorporated the StatCast data for a while. And, you know, I, I look at pitchers that allow a lot of hard contact. And those are guys that I typically look to fade, you know, especially if their numbers, their ERA, FIP, XFIP discrepancies, you know, signal that maybe they've gotten fortunate. And this year, hard contact is just, it's not as penal. It's not as detrimental as it has been in previous seasons. And in fact, now over the last couple of weeks or so, We've seen strikeout percentage decrease and we've seen walk rates decrease as well because pitchers have no fear of pitching to contact. They don't have to because the ball's just not carrying anymore. So that's been a really big adjustment. I have not been able to wrap my head around yet because in a lot of cases I would prioritize high strikeout, high ground ball pitchers. Well, right now there aren't a lot of strikeouts to go around and fly balls aren't carrying. So being a ground ball guy is actually worse in some respects. So it's just, it's really, really incredibly challenging where, you know, six weeks into the season, five weeks into the season, whatever we are, I generally feel very comfortable with, you know, kind of where I'm at, how I'm seeing things and all of that. And now I just, I find myself kind of trying to reinvent the wheel on the fly because a lot of what I'm accustomed to seeing happen in May isn't happening. You know, it's warming up, right? Offense is not getting that much better. It's just, the overs kind of come back around because the books have adjusted and are setting totals lower. So I I don't know what the future holds with the humidor. I don't know if the warmer weather will actually create more offense, but I'm kind of going on the assumption that it will. And I think that's hurting me, but also going on the assumption that some of these bad pitchers, you know, will actually start performing to their true talent levels, but they're getting away with murder in terms of hard contact and low strikeout rates. See, this is really fascinating conversation because I think as betters, we should really welcome uncertainty more than we actually than we do. Like if you pick up on, on a trend like what you're talking about, Adam, where strikeouts start to go down and walks start to go down, there's prop markets being offered at like every single book now. Where if you're early to pick up on that and they're being priced as if they were this is the same as years past, you could really get out in front of that by weeks and make a lot of money on that. But then there's always for me, and this is what I always have a challenge with, is trusting the the, the hypothesis or trusting what you see, because I think it's natural for us to say, oh, this is just a blip on the radar v- versus what we're used to. And things will eventually get back to the norm. And for me, the more and more I watch baseball now, the more and more I convince myself that no, it's it's not going to get back to the norm. This is the game that we're dealing with this year. Um, but it, it, you know, just speaking from a pure baseball standpoint, it's definitely one of those sports where just a, a change in the ball is going to change the entire dynamic of the game. And if you're quick to pick up on that, I think there's a lot of money to be made 
But the natural challenge is, do I trust that there was actually a change in this ball or could it have just been complete random variance? Like how long is var- is variance a thing there for us? So exactly. Like, okay, through 20 games, through 30, 40, 50, and then you're like, okay, we're halfway through the season. But now. but by that, that point, everyone else might have caught on, right? For sure. And then there's also a chance that just in general, like you, it was a regular season anyways, but the first month of the season had like an insanely low scoring rate. It was just like, oh, remember that year where no one was scoring for April, but then it was fine? Or sorry, no one was scoring for yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. I guess May. That's the challenge with the sport. And then to add things, to further complicate things, 2019, for example, right? The pitchers are coming out and they're getting these blisters because of the seams on the ball. And they're talking about how the ball is different. And literally Major League Baseball comes out and says, there's been no changes to the ball. It's the same ball from years past. So now if you're, if you have this hypothesis of like, oh, you know, they changed the ball scorings up because of the ball change. I'm hearing the pitchers talk about it, but then the league actually issues a statement saying, no, 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 it's the same as it's been before. It further compounds things. But this is kind of uh, what interests me so much about baseball is because such a small change like that. I mean, it's not really small. It's the, it's the ball. No, that that's a playing. massive change, that's a, but, but, but it has such a, a huge impact. And, and, I have personally never had the stones to basically get out in front of that because I've always just been like, huh, let's wait and see if this happens a little bit more. And then by the time you wait and see market is caught up. And now we see all these lower totals in baseball now where the edge that anyone would have had betting the unders early in the year has essentially evaporated. Maybe. Well, and I, and, and something I think is really interesting too, is, you know, we've, we've heard the pitchers say that there's a major consistency issue with the baseballs as well. Like they, you know, after a fall ball, they get a ball thrown to them by the plate umpire and it just feels completely different. And, and I don't know. I mean, this may just be cherry picking an example, but you know, on Wednesday when we're recording this, Austin Riley hits a dribbler up the third baseline in the game between the Braves and the Brewers. And it just rolls foul. I mean, it was maybe 45 feet down the line, spins and rolls foul, right? So that ball's all scuffed up, gets thrown out of play. Next pitch, he nukes the ball 430 feet. (laughs) And it's like, you know, okay, I don't know if that was a different ball or not, but just that two-minute sequence illustrates the difficulty of baseball, where you go from a 45-foot infield single to a 430-foot three-run homer, and there's absolutely nothing you can do to account for that. I mean, you know, it just it is what it is. It's the variance in the nature of the game. But those are things you have to contend with in any given season. But now you add all these differences with the baseball. I mean, it's you, you can drive yourself crazy if you don't have the proper mindset for trying to bet baseball and just kind of you know, rolling with the punches and riding the ebbs and flows and whatever other expression or cliche you want to use. It's definitely tough. I've been on like the wrong end of some really bad variants and bullpen blowups where you're like, ah, oh, you know, I had this many leads in a row going into the ninth. They all blew it. Then it's like, am I missing something? Am I not evaluating the bullpens properly? It is a crazy game because there's just so many numbers you can look at and you can always find a way to spin things. But um, I do, you know, I, I do relish it overall just because there's that much data available to you. And a- adding on the data side of things, Adam, we obviously have these projection systems because when I first started betting baseball, uh, I would literally DM the guys from Steamer all the time and say, "Can you, you know, can you send me your projection systems before the, you know, you actually post them publicly?" And they were very nice guys. And there was all obviously Zips was a big one as well that people used to use. But you could at one point just blindly beat baseball by using Steamer's projections. Nowadays, I don't know. I highly doubt it. But I know that there's more and more projection systems in the market. Uh, I see Adam Chernoff doing, um, you know, daily picks with someone from the bat um, who, who's, who's those provided. are props only. Those are props only. But in terms of projection systems out there, is that something that you look at? Is it maybe more of an off season thing where you'll take a look at steamer zips, whatever going into a season? Or do you actually look at at their in season projections as the year goes on? This is something that's difficult about being a content creator is when those things start rolling out, I'm doing college basketball, you know, I'm doing conference tournaments and, and March madness and all of that. So, you know, I just, I don't really have the, the time or the attention to pay to those probably. But one thing that I do look to do on more of an individual level is I look for things that maybe those projection systems can't necessarily account for. So like, as you mentioned about the 2019 season with the juice baseball, It's an outlier, but it's something that those projection systems would have taken into account for 2020 and probably 2021 as well. I look for, we'll take Logan Webb as an example. So Logan Webb, he had a 26.5% strikeout rate last year, and the projection systems this year had him down for 21.5. 
And I'm thinking to myself, why? Why is there you know so much of a difference between his actual performance and what the projection systems are looking at? So then I went into his pitch usage to see what he did differently last season to generate more swing and miss, to generate a higher strikeout rate. And it was a difference of you know throwing more sinkers, something with more downward action, and also a 12% increase in throwing his slider. So I try to use it for that. I try to find maybe some undervalued starting pitchers that maybe you know added velocity or changed their breaking ball. Or a lot of guys for the Braves, for example, they've thrown their their worst pitch less often because that's been their organizational philosophy. That's something that a projection system really can't account for. So I don't necessarily look at it from a team level. I kind of look at it from an individual level and see guys that maybe made a big leap in a certain area, if that's accounted for. And if not, is it something that I find repeatable and can maybe use to my advantage? That's interesting. Now, I know we've talked a lot and a lot of the examples you've brought up are, are pitcher specific of looking at this specific pitcher and so on and so forth. Now, I have friends at Bet Baseball. I know the stuff that they like to look at. And I'm just curious if you ever find any value in looking at it from the other perspective where you'll take a, a specific team, for example. And I, I'm just throwing this out as a completely, it's not, it's not a real example. It's hypothetical here. But you might say, the Yankees just smoke pitchers who throw a cutter or something like that. And they'll, they'll, they'll look up specific, um, you know, they'll find specific teams that tend to perform very well or very poorly against a certain type of starting pitcher rather than the opposite way around. Is that part of your handicapping process? I, I, I don't know how, like, obviously you have to account for the specific players in the lineup as well. And there's so much to take into account. It's not just the, you know, team-based stats. But I feel like that's potentially something that could be overlooked in the market. Um, I don't know how granular people are getting now with specific type of pitch data, but it seems to me at least the most of the guys I talk to, they're not looking specifically at what pitches a pitcher throws or what pitches a, a hitter might uh, specifically perform well against because they prefer to just take the larger sample of data, right? Why am I going to limit this to 80, 80 sliders that this, this batter's faced when I can just look at the you know, the 8,000 total pitches that he's faced type of thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it is something that I tend to do more in the summer where I feel like, you know, a lot of pitchers are, are pretty properly lined. The market gets more efficient. The market tightens up a little bit. It's something where I will try to look for an edge, especially too, because, you know, it, it takes a pretty significant sample size for a lot of that stuff to be, you know, uh, to, to have a stabilization point to be something that I feel like is predictive. So it is something I will look to do in the summer. Absolutely. And I'll also look for, kind of team macro trends, you know, a team this year, for example, the Milwaukee Brewers, right? So the Milwaukee Brewers offense has really taken off this year. They've hit for a lot more power than they have in previous seasons. They're hitting a lot more fly balls. And the interesting thing for them is that the lack of carry hasn't really seemed to hurt them as much as it's hurt other teams, but they've completely pivoted on their offensive philosophy. You know, I saw that with the Braves a few years ago, uh, you know, a, a team that obviously won the world series last year. I saw, I've seen that with the giants where, they kind of stopped hitting ground balls at home and started embracing the idea of, you know what, we're just going to elevate the baseball and try to hit for power no matter where we are. So I do look for some of those macro trends on teams in terms of their batted ball splits. But in terms of specific matchups, yeah, if I've got, let's say, a two-pitch pitcher, we'll take, you know, like a Chris Archer type or a Chris Paddock, somebody like that, you know, I will look and see, you know, what does the opposition do against four seam fastballs and against sliders because Archer is going to throw 52, 53% sliders probably in a given start. So that's a guy where it's pretty easy to take a look at because he's a two pitch guy. But if I do see, you know, you think about Robbie Ray, for example, you know, and you think about his pitch usage and some of the changes that the blue Jays made with him and some of the things he's not doing with the Mariners this season, I will, once we get deeper into the season, look at those things to get, you know, a better idea of, how that pitcher will match up against the given team. I just need the sample size to build up in order to do that. Now you talked about looking at a lot of that stuff in the summer. Um, do you find that your volume does start to tail off in the summer? Like, are you, is it easier for you to find plays at the beginning of the year that it might be three months from now? You know, it's interesting because typically I kind of ease into a season, especially in Major League Baseball, because we've talked about a million times already, the ball is different every year. <laughs> right. So, you know, I, I don't really know what to do with the baseball going into the season. And I have talks with, you know, people like uh, at MLB dream on Twitter, who's a very, very sharp MLB handicapper. We discuss stuff like that going into the year of like, you know, what are we hearing from spring training? What are we kind of picking up on? 
I'll even ask beat writers, you know, I'm friends with the, uh, the guardians beat writer for the athletic. And I'll be like, Hey, what are you hearing about the baseball in spring training? Is, does it, does it feel different? Are the pitchers saying anything, you know, just to try and get some idea for early on in the season. But this is typically the time that my volume gets a little bit higher because I have the ability to use some of those predictive metrics. I just don't know if that's going to be the case this year because I have to figure out, you know, how predictive they actually are given that we have a, a really big outlier offensive season. Uh, one of the big things for me when I was starting to branch out into sports that uh, I wasn't, you know, fully acclimated with, or I, j- you know, just started handicapping was using Twitter as a platform to find other sharp people that understood the sport um, and trying to learn as much from them as possible. Specifically for me was basketball uh, because I'm not a big basketball better. And I just came across a lot of accounts that were giving out some really good stuff. So you mentioned MLB dream as being one for baseball. Are there any other accounts out there that you think are highly worth following for someone out there who might just be new to the sport and wants to, you know, grasp or absorb as much information as possible. You know, you know, I think a guy like, you know, Saris, uh, his, his information is invaluable. And, and he's a guy that, you know, a, a lot like me takes a lot of very advanced concepts and, and, you know, spits them out in a way that makes sense to everybody. Uh, he's a phenomenal writer. Travis Sawchick is another very good one. I do a lot of reading, you know, I, I don't necessarily have the, uh, the baseball betting community or the, the betting community in general that I know that you have and that other people I talk to have, uh, but, you know, a lot of it is reading. A lot of it is, you know, searching for players' names on Twitter and just kind of seeing, you know, has something been written about them recently? Is there something, you know, that, that is worth looking into? You know, Tom Verducci of SI wrote a great piece about Brent Strom, the new Arizona Diamondbacks pitching coach. And, yeah, you know, you see the improvements that the Diamondbacks have made. They had a 515 team ERA last year. Yeah. This year, they're basically a 500 or better team in the best division in the league. And, you know, you, you kind of get a little bit more context into why they've improved and if it's sustainable. And so I, I do a lot of that. I do a lot of reading, a lot of digging, uh, you know, just to kind of see what's sort of out there and, you know, also try to share that with my readers too, because I, I you know, if I find something that I think is, is useful, I want to pass that on to them. I don't want to, you know, store it away like it's an acorn or something like that. I just, I try to share as much information as I can. And, you know, uh, it's, it's one of those things where you, there's, there's always going to be something to write about over 162 game season. So I just try to find whatever it is that may be helpful for me. Well, we do appreciate you helping us out with uh, a baseball betting primer here. For those who do want to follow Adam Burke on Twitter, it's at skating tripods. And I do really like your Twitter description. <laughs> There's a lot in here that is could, we can unpack. Yeah, it's really cool. Cleveland native traveler, IPA aficionado, ex beer league defenseman, 500 time dumb and dumber viewer. So that's the one I think that people want to know about. I, I want to hit you rapid fire with something about every single one of these. You're Cleveland native. If I'm a tourist to Cleveland, what's the one spot that I have to hit up? Well, look, if you're a tourist, it's the rock and roll hall of fame and museum. I mean, you know, it's, it's something you at least have to do once without a doubt. And if you do it in the summer, catch a game at progressive field too, because uh, I'm biased, but I still love that ballpark. And also if you're somebody who's into craft beer, masthead brewery downtown is uh probably my favorite spot in the cleveland metro area uh but also too if you've got kids or you're a thrill ride seeker cedar point in sandusky ohio is only about an hour northwest of cleveland uh that's a a really cool place to check out there's a great brewery up there called clag as well i've been to cedar point twice i think it's fantastic you definitely have to be into the high thrill roller coasters top thrill dragster which you would be familiar with this is just a little piece of trivia for anyone up there but you can actually see the top of the CN Tower. So you can see Toronto from the top of Top Thrill Dragster at Cedar Point across the water, which is actually pretty cool because you are up there very slowly over the top. But that's a, a great amusement park. In terms of traveling, your favorite spot you've ever been to? So I was just there in November for the first time, and I absolutely loved it. Bozeman, Montana was incredible. I mean, I, I've, I've been to Hawaii and obviously, I mean, Hawaii kind of speaks for itself, but I, I kind of wanted to go with something that maybe people wouldn't think too much about. Uh, for those that watch Yellowstone, obviously, you know how beautiful that, that Yellowstone Valley is and all of that. Uh, but, you know, we did the one night in a cabin thing on Airbnb. That was great. We stayed one night in Bozeman, uh, just a really cool town, awesome food. If you're a meat fan like I am, just fresh off the field. Uh, it felt like <laughs> home. It was it was a really great place there in Bozeman. I had a great time. We are meat fans. I'm actually a Yellowstone fan as well, though. I think Rip Wheeler is maybe the greatest character on television right now. 
Like, yes, I would agree with that. Just for everyone listening, if you're in Montana, I'm sure it's great. I've never been. The sports betting there, though, needs a lot of work. As a lot of people know, <laughs> the Montana State Lottery is notorious for dealing, I believe it was minus 42 a side yeah. on, yeah. Um, on major markets. So if you want to bet on baseball, it's probably not your best spot. But, uh, you know, fresh off the field meat, as you said, I, I doubt it gets better than that. Yeah, that sounds, uh, that sounds pretty awesome. So IPA aficionado. Your best IPA and what you think is the most overrated IPA. So I'll start by pissing everybody off and saying the most overrated one. I, I think High Life from Cigar City down in Florida is a very, very overrated IPA. It, it was one of those things where when it was hard to find, it you know, it just it kind of had that luster to it, but now uh now not so much. As far as best, man, I've had so many good ones. Uh, Mass that I mentioned earlier, they do different citrusy flavors of their Dream Crusher IPA. It's a triple IPA. That's a really good one. Um, more Citra than all Citra from half or other half brewery in Brooklyn, New York. I had that recently, and it blew my mind. A good ten and a half percent are there. And the the beers from Clag. You know, if you ever make a trip out to Cedar Point, go to Clag. Uh, it's a very interesting place. Clag stands for cocky little Asian guy. Um, and, and, and he is, he is that about his beer, but it is damn good. It's a very, very citrus forward IPA, which is what I kind of like more than the, the pioneer stuff. So do I. And dream crusher is basically what they call my bets around the office here as well. They are dream crushers. Hasn't been a good run. Um, ex beer league defenseman. I didn't know you played hockey. So, um, he didn't say it was hockey. Oh, that's true. Am, am I, can I assume it's hockey? It was hockey. Yes. Okay, fair yeah, enough. The, the fair skate, enough. the skating tripods part. That, that was the name of our team, the Skating Tripods Hockey Club. Interesting. How how long and, did, uh, did did you play like rep, like actual serious hockey? Uh, well, no, it wasn't very serious. I I played in high school. Uh, in fact, I actually didn't start. I started. I took learn to skate lessons when I was three or four years old, and then uh, just got away from that. I played more street and roller growing up, and then I got back into playing hockey in high school, and uh, I was awful but I will forever thank my dad for making me stick with it and, you know, kind of learning how to stay with something, even though, you know, maybe it's not something that you're super good at, but you know, it, it was kind of a, uh, it was a learning experience as a teenager growing up and, you know, kind of having those relationships with teammates and everything. And then I just gravitated, gravitated towards being a beer league guy. So uh, I, I was better at drinking than playing hockey, but we did have some pretty good players on the team and uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun and, and I miss it. And in fact, actually, when I moved out here to Vegas, I went and bought all new equipment just so I could get back on the ice and get a little bit of exercise and meet some people as well. Yeah. New new gitch, as they say it in Ontario, for all the listeners outside of Ontario. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, we're a little bit biased growing up in Canada, and we've played hockey our whole lives. But, um, yeah, beer league hockey, just enjoying some brews after the game in the dressing room with the guys. It's just, uh, it's just a great experience. You get the exercise. Then you pack on a few more pounds after the game, completely ruin the exercise. It's um, uh, it's pretty fun. Uh, Johnny played a pretty high level of hockey. We often have uh, debates around the office because he thinks if he played in the 80s, he would be basically putting up numbers at the same level of, of Wayne Gretzky. He watches... Guaranteed. He watches the, 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 the games from the 80s where the goalies are doing like kick saves and trying to, to knock the puck Go out. on YouTube, search Daryl Sittler 10-point game. If I was playing in that game, I would have popped 23 points. <laughs> minimum. Minimum. And I'm saying my current form, like I have my equipment. Let's say I have my equipment bag right there. I just put it on and go on. I'm not even saying like my current equipment, current everything. I go in. My skates just got them sharpened yesterday. Didn't do it myself, which I normally do. They're not even the best sharpened skates right now. I'm popping 23 points. But... Go watch the game before you judge me. Because right now, I bet you're thinking, I'd be like, oh, this guy's out to lunch. Like, what's he saying? Go actually watch the game and see, like, where the goalie is positioned and, like, how slow the pucks are coming in. And then we can chat. About we'll, it. Put a li we'll put a link to that in the, our YouTube description. But uh, I've always found it, found it fascinating to compare eras of sports, right? Because it's, it's very difficult. Like, you look at Wayne Gretzky when he played, right? He could not really compete in this... NHL and in like his state. No, that's why they have but, the era era adjusted. Gretzky's the greatest player in NHL history, but the reason is is because he dominated his time in the NHL more than anyone dominates now. But I think it's very clear to say that a, probably one of you know name a bottom tier NHL player right now. Yeah, 
and put them in their current equipment, current state, current physical peak into that era, it probably would be better than Gretzky. But I also wonder about this with baseball a lot of times now because pitchers throw so much harder, right? You think about guys like Greg Maddox who could paint the corners back in the day, right? He's just like, and also like think about the umps back in the day who would give him those calls that were a foot off the plate. What would Greg Maddox be in today's MLB? I don't know. His control is so great, but I always wonder. Like even... You know, even we Mariano gotta a, Rivera. We got to do yeah. an episode, me and you, on this. One of the next just, ones. Just yeah, just bringing in guests. We'll go. To- no, we'll go sport by sport, and we'll break it down. Because I'm, I don't claim to be like great. Obviously, you know, if I played in the NBA, I would be absolute trash. Like the guys back then were still, you know, six foot ten and dunking. Like it's not like we're going to be any better. But certain sports, I think you go down down the line. Baseball would be one where the era is so much different. Like the pitchers right now. Like the way, let's say, like Clayton Kershaw in his prime when he's like dealing, or Max Scherzer, give me like another good pitcher, hard like, thrower. Yeah. How how much would they just rack up K's back in the day, right, Adam? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you think about a guy like Emmanuel Classe, the closer for the Guardians. I mean, he throws like 101 mile per hour cutters. <laughs> like it's just the game. And and to that point, not to get on a soapbox and go on a rant or anything like that, but. You know, everyone's like, oh, well, why don't guys just go the other way? Why don't guys do this? Why don't guys do that? Well, fastball velocity is higher than it's ever been. Slider usage is higher than it's ever been. It's just hard to hit. You know, it's very, very hard to hit. You know, the human brain can only accommodate so much in terms of reaction time for identifying pitches, getting the body to swing, all that. There's a kid pitching in college at Tennessee who touched 105.3 on the radar gun. He's a 22-year-old kid. Like, I, I don't know what the end point is for velocity in baseball, but hitting is certainly going to keep getting harder. Yeah, I, it always used to bother me when um, when people used to talk about Anthony Rizzo, right? Because he, he notoriously chokes up on the bat uh, in two strike counts. And, and you know, was, but he's a very good hitter. It's not like everyone can just choke up and hit for contact when they're fa- going to get like a 100 mile fa- an hour fastball. Um, uh, that always frustrates me. It's like, yeah, why don't they do this? This one guy does it and he's very good and everyone else is just going to follow suit. But uh, hold up. We're already off the rails. We're talking <laughs> baseball. I do have to ask a, a question that came up. So this is, it's going to be a weird one. We're, we're putting you on the spot here. Okay. I'm looking personally to get into the baseball card market. Okay. I won't, I don't want to be the guy who like, you know, grabs a box and breaks all the packs and tries to go for something. What I'm looking to do is find a player, one player specifically, and buy up a bunch of their rookie cards and then just hold th- those for like 20 years and hope, hope that player grows. So my question to you, sir, is which player am I going for right now? And keep in mind, I'm looking for a player who is not necessarily, like, you know what I mean? You go for Vlad Guerrero, obviously you buy a bunch of Guerrero rookie cards. It's going to be super pricey right now. So I'm looking for a hidden gem, someone that may... Maybe didn't have that great a rookie year or great two years, but their rookie cards are available super cheap. And I can maybe pick some up for, you know, relatively cheap. And then uh, this, if this player has a couple of good seasons, we're going. That's the question. Give me some, give me some players and take your time here. I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, it's all good. It's actually funny. Uh, I haven't done much in terms of, of sports cards for a long period of time, but when I was growing up, my dad owned a sports card store. Oh. So it was a, a huge part of my childhood, you know, getting involved and, Ripping open packs of score and pro set hockey and oh, yeah. you know, all those kinds of things. So to, to um, compare it to hockey, what I'd be looking for here is I'd be looking to get in on like a Matt Barzal type card where he played, they had released his rookie card. He was not really supposed to be good. You buy up his rookie card. It was literally, you could buy up a couple cards of Matt Barzal, like most expensive card might've been like a hundred bucks, two bucks, three bucks, four bucks for a lot of his rookie cards. And then after he wins the Calder, now, anything from his rookie season, you're looking at like, you know, $500 plus. He had some cards go, you know, 20000 So be looking for like a Matt Barzal type where he wasn't supposed to be good and then ended up being a good player. Or he wasn't supposed to be good. I mean, I, I was thinking of a guy who hasn't made his debut yet. O'Neal Cruz for the Pirates is, is a rookie card that's probably worth getting your hands on. Uh, I mean, the Pirates are notoriously cheap, so who knows when he'll come up. <laughs> but he's a six foot seven guy that currently plays short, probably going to get moved to the outfield makes absurdly violent contact. He hit a ball 121 miles per hour in AAA the other day. Uh, so that's a guy that that probably has a very high ceiling. Man, in terms of guys that you know, maybe started out a little bit slow, um, that's a good question. You know, because the thing of it is, like, you know, these guys that that kind of the, – the leap from 
double A to triple A to the major leagues is, is the biggest in sport. You know, I mean, guys can walk off a college football field or a college basketball court and they can play from day one. And it's it's really not that big of a deal for them. Um, that's a good question. I'm looking at by like an Alex Gordon type, you know, where it's like that guy's written off completely. He's values at an all time low. And then next thing you know, oh, you know what? He's actually a good player. He plays a full career on Kansas City and now he's worth something. I kind of wonder if maybe somebody like a Brendan Rodgers for the Rockies is a, is a decent thought. You know, I mean, first of all, he's playing in a place where you, you can put up numbers for as long as he's there. But also, you know, he was a very highly regarded prospect. And, you know, everyone just kind of expected him to show up and hit just because of the park factor. Hasn't really done it yet, but he's a very athletic player that I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's somebody that, you know, kind of finds it here in the not too distant future. All right, I'll be looking into it. I appreciate the answer, and I know we didn't prep you for this. We It was not in the no, show notes. <laughs> not in the notes. But uh, it's something that came up around the office. We were uh, just joking around with all the guys, and um, we're you know, sport cards are a crazy, crazy market right now. Everything's been going up, but uh, it's a lot of fun. It's bring, bringing back a lot of nostalgia from the childhoods, I'm sure, as it did with you and your dad in the sport card shop. So, Rob, yeah, the fun, for the sure. F- I mean, maybe, maybe there are some guys from the White Sox you know, I mean, uh, and Eloy Jimenez has kind of fallen by the wayside because he can't stay healthy. But that's a guy with, you know, significant upside, really good contact skills. Uh, you know, Luis Robert, I mean, he's playing, but I don't think that he's fully lived up to the expectations placed on him. So, so I, I took a look uh, at I, I, I took a look at him. He still have valued pretty high in the card market, which is, which is basically um, it's a market, you know, it's another market. It's, it's, another a, market. it's like the betting market. It's another market. You yeah. know, people still think that he's going to play well. I think actually Louis Robert is actually probably someone who's overvalued right now because he hasn't really lived up to it. But since he was such a highly toted prospect, everyone's still, you know, riding him hard. Like, okay, this is the, this is the next Mike Trout, whatever, so to speak, or, you know, obviously Mike Trout caliber player. I don't mean position wise. So I've, I've never told John, I've never told either anyone about this really. But I do have rookie cards from one baseball player who was trying. I was trying to do something very similar to this. What'd you get? Ricky Weeks Jr. This was like eight or nine years ago, maybe 10 years ago. I had him on my fantasy team once, complete bust in like his rookie year. But I I watched a lot of his games and I just liked him a lot. I'm like, this guy's going to turn his career around. I'm going to buy a bunch of rookie cards. Unfortunately, those are probably worth absolutely nothing right now but i'm gonna go look he was on the brewers i'm looking at ricky he w- w- at the time i got them he would have been on the a's i'm pretty sure because it was early on his career or maybe i'm wrong maybe i i don't even remember i just lost so much uh, i've lost so much touch with baseball at this point but oh he did have one big season 29 bombs yeah he hit a bunch of bombs he but he was like you know he's a speedy guy he was a stolen base threat a lot of times as well yeah, fair enough. I still have those somewhere. I have to dig them up, probably at my parents' place. But um, I do want to ask about Dumb and Dumber because you're a 500 time Dumb and Dumber viewer, and in my opinion, it's the the best comedy of all time, which I can recite from start to finish. Best scene in Dumb and Dumber. So, because I grew up such a hockey fan, it, it has to be the diner scene with with Sea Bass and the fellows with with Cam <laughs> Neely, and and then just pulling the prank at the end. And when when Jim Carrey tells him they caught up with him about a half mile on the road and slit his throat, the look that Jeff Daniels gives him as Harry Dunn is absolutely incredible. It is is one of my favorite scenes of of all time in a movie, but let alone in that one. Do you hate Dumb and Dumber 2? You know what? I I don't hate it. I don't think it's good, but I don't hate it. I I just, I don't know. I, I watch it and I'll laugh at a couple of things, but it's, it's certainly better than the Dumb and Dumberer that didn't even have Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels in it, whatever yeah. that mess was. Oh, I never but watched that I was, one. It's actually funny. So I saw the sec the the actual sequel, we'll call it, uh, with my nephew. My nephew's only two years and two weeks younger than me. And growing up, we watched Dumb and Dumber together a ton. So it was it was pretty cool to see the second one with him uh, down in Columbus where he was living at the time. Uh, so maybe that kind of skewed my initial thought of the movie, just sort of the nostalgia element of it. But it's it's not terrible. All right, I'm actually a fan of Dumb and Dumber too. I'm uh, not afraid to uh, say it. It, I, it. It's not a bad movie at all. I I did laugh multiple times. I I judge a movie based on, I would say, how entertained and 
was I during the movie and how much fun did I have? So if it's a comedy, then I'm basically judging it by like how many times that I actually legitimately laugh out loud during this movie. And it, it was, it was a lot during Dumb and Dumber too. I think a lot of comedy sequels are better than people give them credit for, but because they have such high standards from the first one that they off, like, like I think if Dumb and Dumb, Dumb and Dumber 2 was a standalone movie and you never knew about Dumb and Dumber, people probably enjoy it a lot more. For sure. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's well, and also too something I think with, with comedy movies is like the wheelhouse for us with Dumb and Dumber. Like life is a lot different when the second one came out. I mean, the second one was what fifteen years or something after the first one. Uh, you know, it's just it, it's it's kind of different. You know, so I think that may be part of it too. You know, just kind of the the stupid comedy that we maybe found funny initially. You know, is that something that kind of carries over throughout? And for me, I think to a degree it did, but it, you know, probably wouldn't be the case for everybody. There, yeah. There's definitely a nostalgia component to a lot of these. Like, I, I it's hard to say. Like, I, I obviously watched Dumb and Dumber so much when I was growing up that, like I said, I can I have every line memorized in the movie. There's a, c- a component of it as well. But like, I watched The Big Lebowski recently with my wife and a friend of mine who had never seen it before. And they're like, how the hell did you ever enjoy this movie? Dude, that happens all the time. Man. Right. Because none of those movies are actually good from back. <laughs> like, they're not actually good, good in a sense that like you can show like, oh, man, that exactly what Dumb you Dumb and Dumber said. is is actually good. No, it's show t- it to it someone, show it to like a kid who's like 20 years old right now. He's gonna be like, what the hell is this is not funny at all. Like, what are you joke? Are you laughing because the guy fell off his chair? Like, but at the time we laughed hard. Yeah, I guess. I mean, there's two, the, the, there's for me the scene where um harry has had an extra pair of gloves the whole time that is hilarious to me and then also the diner scene where the different diner scene uh where they kill you know they put rat poison in in uh he accidentally eats the rat poison but where jim carrey and uh um what's his name the names eluded me now this is horrible. Uh, I'm put on the spot, but with the spicy peppers in the burger or the spicy burgers, hilarious stuff. One of the best movies ever. I will not. I'll go to my grave. It is one it of should have won an Oscar. It is. It is so good. So good. But maybe maybe why it's, isn't there? Why isn't there an Oscar a comedy category for Oscars? Because it's an award show and those are naturally designed. To but not but be but good. but the uh, the Golden Globes splits them up. Yeah, but look at it. Okay, we don't. Need, we'll get into this on yeah, the other controversial episode with, with the sports <laughs> leagues. Find me an like. Go look at the list of movies that are like Oscar nominated. They're not good. A lot of them suck. Yeah, the majority yeah. of them are not good. Me and Diane used to do this every single year. We watch every movie that was nominated for Best Picture, and then after like four or five years, we're like, why? Yeah, are you we, why are we doing do this that. to ourselves? If you've ever watched The Tree of Life with Brad Pitt and Jessica Chastain and something else. And you've sat through that entire movie. I commend you because that was, it's a, it's a piece of art. The That's not what I would watching call it. That is probably watching the actual Oscars themselves. Oh yeah. But you occasionally get something like Will Smith, you know, slapping Chris. Yeah. Rock. But if you watch the actual Oscars, that was, you didn't even know about that. It was more a social media. Thing. I've actually watched a lot of Oscars though, because I, I just bet. I them. bet them. Yeah. yeah. I don't watch though. I right. bet. And then I don't watch. Right. All right, Adam, we'll, uh, we'll get you out here with the closing question that we asked to all our guests. If you could go back five years and talk to a previous version of yourself, what piece of advice would you give to your former self? Yeah, and, and this is something that, that I, I continue to struggle with. I'm sure you do as well. I'm sure a lot of people in, in our line of work and just in general do. You know, I am my harshest critic. You know, I, I feel like nothing I ever do is good enough. Try to be a perfectionist, not only in an imperfect world, but especially in an imperfect industry, you know, like ours, where, you know, if you're right, 55, 56 percent of the time, that's damn good. You know, the idea of being wrong that often and still being good at something, it's just hard for me to wrap my head around. So that's the thing for me. You know, I just I, I'm so harsh and such a critic about everything that I do, uh, you know, overanalyzing, especially in a down period, because you know, it's, it's not only my money on the line. It's also the people that read me and all of that. You know, I, I, it's been something where I've had, you know, some mental health issues in terms of, of having bad betting runs and all those kinds of things. So, you know, still something I'm working on even into my mid thirties, but, you know, just understanding that per- perfection is just, it's not an option, no matter how hard I strive for it. I think that's good advice. 
I think it's a, a lot of us struggle with the same thing, even winning months sometimes, and you feel like you should have won more. It's very easy to spin positives as a negative, and it's also very easy to spin a negative as catastrophic. It's um, a dangerous game to play. It is, but uh, that's really good advice from Adam Burke. You can follow him on Twitter at Skating Tripods, and you can follow his stuff with VSIN at VSIN Live. He is a sports betting analyst for them year round. Adam, appreciate you joining us. It was uh, good to finally get this one in the book after trying so hard for weeks, but um, much appreciated for the patience and thanks for uh, thanks for joining us on Circles Off. No, it was, it was worth the wait for me. Hopefully it was for you guys and for the listeners as well. But, uh, you know, thanks for having me. And and honestly, you know, you're somebody I've looked up to in this business for a long period of time. The way that you conduct yourself, the the sh- how sharp you are across so many different markets and just what you've accomplished in the space, not only the betting space, but also sports media. Uh, thanks, you know, it's, Adam. It's I been appreciate an honor that. to be a friend of yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. Uh, no, same. I, obviously, uh, same goes for you as well. I mean, we've we've chatted on and off for years, and uh, really appreciate the work that you do out there. And I said this um, in the in the preamble before we had you on, but your baseball previews every year, I will put them up against any piece of content that's out in the space previewing any season. They are fantastic. They're so thorough. I used to buy the baseball prospectus, you know, the thick book, and read through that. And I started reading your season long previews and I literally stopped buying baseball prospectus. So I think that's a compliment, um, but really appreciate you having you on. And for all the listeners out there, uh, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube. If you're listening on uh, any other platform, please rate and review five stars and we'll be back next week with another episode.